So, the next one, pre-hospital care. It's great to see so many sycophants in the audience because you're all like, yay, what's going on there? Like, I'll tell you what, we, we've come an awful long way from uh, delivering patients uh, in bread vans, you know, to the hospital unaccompanied, I might add. And, um, you know, our system has evolved just like your system has evolved. We used to have nurses who came from the hospital with the driver who was usually the porter or the security guard, and they took the patient back to that local hospital, and therefore care was very much this postcode lottery, you know. And um, what, what, what sort of hospitals did they bring people to? Well, the system had houses of recovery, didn't it? It, it was a place to go and recover. It, it wasn't anything special. There were certainly no trauma systems. And um, as time progressed, we got ambulance services, and the ambulance services were, you know, made by the state, and the state employed paramedics, but it was still very much based out of the local hospitals and the traditional framework and structure. It has taken a long, long, long time to realize that no shit Sherlock, care doesn't start at the front door at a house of recovery. Care starts where you get ill, where you get injured. And care needs to start as soon as possible for those time-critical scenarios. And that care could be as simple as diesel, in other words, logistically, or jet fuel, getting the patient from there with a stroke to the right hospital. In other words, you're not just going to your local hospital, all right, to get the care that you need. And for that, you require a strong system. Now... Our hospital, <clears throat> level four hospital, doesn't act as a standalone. We act as a hub. And over the next uh, you know, few, few minutes, I'm going to be talking about how that hub interacts, how we interact as a hospital with our wider community. Because we certainly don't just do care at the front door. We do care outside. <clears throat> this patient with a traumatic brain injury just outside the gates of a very large district general hospital, in other words, a level two hospital, did not get taken to that hospital. That accident was directly outside that hospital gate. They did not go into that hospital. Rather, they were received by highly qualified paramedics, and they had their life-saving care performed on that scene before being transferred to the right hospital, which is the trauma hospital. In other words, they're bypassed. And critical care support is all about delivering exactly the same standards of care, the same levels of monitoring, the same diagnostics, the same interventions that you would find in hospital. Anything less is cowboy. Our critical care support services had their genesis in 1975. Hugh Doran lives on the east side of Cork City in Carrigtool and has his own GP practice. His father was instrumental in setting up this service in the Cork region in 1975. My father, who was working in East Cork as a GP, uh, responded to a need, I guess, and developed his own pre-hospital emergency uh, service. And that included uh, providing immediate care uh, at the roadside and in the home. I was infected by that bug, but I'm on call pretty much all the time. And when I arrived in Ireland 16, 17 years ago, um, there was nothing in West Cork. And it was a postcode lottery, really. And so we founded this charity, West Cork Rapid Response, which supports existing emergency service workers, critical care physicians like myself, to be able to go out and provide care in our, in our community. And uh, my family have literally grown up around response vehicles um, and emergency vehicles. That's the same lad, by the way, 16 years on. Um, and this is supported by an amazing community team. And there certainly is an amazing community spirit that keeps the service on the road the spirit of West Cork, which is a direct translation of that. And we've demonstrated that actually this sort of model is extremely cost-effective. 
we really look at about 125 euros per patient. Now that is nothing. It's peanuts. Compare that with our helicopter service, which sees exactly the same number of patients that we do a year, um, and provides less standard, in other words, a lower standard of care. Um, that's quite stark. And so this model has been perpetuated really by the government and, and rolled out around Ireland. Um, these are my personal stats in terms of what I see pre-hospital. Um, it's going back only eight years. Um, it, the graph got too big to make it for longer. Um, but roughly, we see about 400 patient contacts pre-hospital a year as an individual physician. So our numbers are not small, not by any imagination at all. If you look at the average Sydney HEMS physician, the average Sydney HEMS consultant is looking at about 65 patient contacts a year. Believe it or not, in the way the job plans work. So um, our caseload is very much skewed towards road traffic collisions, falls, and, and cardiac arrest. In other words, where critical care is going to be needed. And 23% of my contacts are little humans. Um, I don't have a choice as to what I go to. And this is quite important as I kickstart the discussion about governance and equipment governance. So, I can get a call, and I promise you this call came through on the dispatch, on the text alert, as an 88-year-old possible sepsis. Okay. I don't have a choice. I can't just get out of the vehicle and go, oops, I better go back to the hospital, to the stores, and grab the pediatric airway gear. So in my bags, and I, and I have three identical bags in the vehicle, we have very strict policies. We do not stock our bags ourselves, so you can't overstock them. We do not change our bags ourselves. We put them into a room. That's not because it's beneath us. It's because we realized if you entrust clinicians to change their own bags, they will leave something out. We have a series of um, vacuum sealed packs for everything, but the bottom line is I can treat any human, be they preterm or be they 100 years old, with exactly the same airway roll. It can be done, but it can only be done if you don't have toys. In other words, you only have what you need, and you have it in the right quantities. You don't have extra, otherwise I go and get a completely new bag. We work in extremely rural environments, and as a team, we literally start intensive care in the field. And pre-hospital emergency medicine, or FEM, simply isn't just bringing the breadth of skills and diagnostic ability out there. It's about being able to create a safe, evidence-based, effective, auditable environment to work in. So w that is what we are specialists in. We are specialists in creating a clinical environment in a non-clinical area. And that's very important. It's about delivering the correct standard of care, not losing sight of the bigger picture. And folks, that takes considerable training and experience over a number of years to develop those systems. And how we integrate and train the next generation um, is really a topic that um, we're going to speak about. But largely, we are doing exactly the same thing we do in hospital, and that's very important. So when we perform a rapid sequence induction of anesthesia as an emergency medicine team, even if it's integrated with our anesthetic colleagues, even if it's integrated with somebody else, we do the same thing every time. And our system of checklists are extremely boring. We've been using exactly the same checklist for 15 years now. We haven't even changed a word on the checklist. And we do so because it's about familiarity. It's all about standards. And it's auditable. So this is the checklist for checking our equipment and checking our frame of mind and framing what we're about to do to the whole team, right? from the start. All right guys, indication for RSI is significant fall from height, reduced level of consciousness. Okay, we're pre-oxygen, just you'd read and I'd check it. Pre-oxygen, yes. Check. Oxygen cylinder, half full. 
Uh, is it? No, it's a quarter. Okay, there's another one there, and I've got another one in the ambulance. Check. Water circuit connected. Check. Connect in tidal seat, uh, CO2. CO2 is connected. Is it running? It's not running yet. It's no. warming up. We'll come back to that. Okay, suction, hand head suction. Hand suction. suction. Hand suction's there. So that video is actually from 15 years ago. All right, so we're doing exactly the same thing. I'll show you another video now. Um, so you think, okay, that patient's relatively stable, that, that we've got a bit of time to do that, and we've got a bit of time to secure the airway. This is a patient who you will look at now and go, oh, bloody hell, we don't have time for checklists. This, this, is, this, this person's too sick. Um, and I'll show you this just to demonstrate how quietly, how logically, without emotion, without anything, two clinicians can go through a checklist with an extremely sick patient. And what it does, it settles you. It calms you down. Uh, water circuit is connected, oxygen check, entitled CO2 filter face mask on. Oh, yeah, I've noticed, yeah. yeah. Suction. Hand suction. 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 Is that the indication? Okay, Kelly. Good girl. Okay, come on, get in. Let's go. Backup's hand up. Backup function available. Check. Okay. Full airway. Full airway here. Could you just locate two nasal airways for me, please? Two nasal airways. Check. They're here. Okay. LMA, I have a size 3 LMA here, and sure. I have a surgical airway kit also here. With a size 2 Where's the surgical airway? Surgical airway kit is right Check. here. I have a backup laryngoscope, and I've checked Right. I have my bougie, my bougie is here. Roger. Okay, my tube size, my tube size is going to be size 7.5. 7, .5. seven and, a half, and a half, yeah. And I have an alternate 7 here, just in case of the backup. Uh, I have tube tape here. Really um, calm, really slow, I have very deliberate. Add in tier two, check. Okay, so what is the blood pressure? The same boring lines that we do every single time. Do you guys use checklists when you are assigned in the emergency department? Some, some do, some nods, some not. Okay. What we found over the years is the worse the patient gets, the more the need for the checklist, and, and, and actually that really settles out the team. So when you get the ultimate bad patient, when some of your standard options are not available, right? that's when it really comes into being, where you read the checklist and go, okay, our bailout plan is an LMA, and you realize that you can't use an LMA in this face because the face has been shot off, all right? And it frames it for the people around you. So this is a bit graphic. But, um, here we go, that's going to work better than, okay, yeah. hold it there, just like that, that's it, that's it, that's it, it'll work well, okay, good, alright, keep going the checklist, okay, handheld backup suction available, uh, yeah, I've got one here, mm -hmm. we're probably going to, that suction's going to be working well tonight, I know, <laughs> Okay, backup suction is here, okay? Okay, oral airway and two nasal airways available? Yeah. We can't. No. Yeah. Okay. LMA available, failed. Can't. No, no. Surgical option. airway kit available. Surgical airway kit is what we need, okay? Right. So I'm going to want one available here. Do you know something? I'm going to have a good look. If I'm not, I'm going to do a surgical airway. And of course, the expression on the paramedic's face, the penny has dropped. This is what we're going to do. And to be honest, I hadn't, I, I, my plan was I'm going to have a look and if I can see some sort of structure, yeah, we're going to put the tube through that sort of structure. And then it occurred to me that this patient was going to get a surgical airway anyway as part of their normal operative procedure going forward. Um, and actually we're going through the checklist that actually cemented it for me. And what was really nice was to be able to do that really calmly, really gently. He was sitting upright, you know, bit a bit of local anesthetic. Job done. Get him in. And it wasn't actually that stressful because you made the decision before you started and you didn't land yourself up in a heap having to do that intervention. Yeah, we, we do 
all sorts of procedures pre-hospital, exactly what you expect in the hospital. So lateral canthotomy is, is not out of the question. Um, we do carry blood, um, and there's a governance process around that um, in terms of how that blood leaves and is stored and, 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 and what like. Um, and, but crucially is that we're providing critical care level of support. So that critical care level of support continues all the way into hospital, which includes obviously the use of ventilators, infusion drivers, everything that you would expect to have on a patient. So our patients are pretty well packaged by the time they hit the facility. And normally we would arrange CT scans before we even get there because our transport times can be hours. The big question in everybody's mind is how do you train these physicians? How do you train people to work in such an environment to provide the emergency medicine? Well, the first thing to say is the emergency medicine part, you're doing the training anyway. So you have it. The 95% of the, the, the job, which is the logistics and how to work pre-hospital is actually really difficult and you can't pay, pay lip service to it. And we get a whole raft of our Irish diaspora who are our trainees who leave. And you, know, you might know some of these people, like Cliff Reed over there. You know? um, uh, it's Cliff, is, uh, there's, there's, there's Brian Burns. Sorry, that's Brian. Owen Fogarty. You know, these are guys who have left because there isn't the structure and there isn't the jobs. And we've worked really, really hard. So how do we take that young, dynamic medical student, and you know he's the one who's going to be a FEM consultant, because look at him with all the other medical students around him. And how do you take him and, and, and produce a pre-hospital doctor? Well, the first thing is, he was pretty keen, even before medical school, he would go out with the lifeboats. So, you know, you already had that sort of sense of, 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 of voluntarism and, 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 and altruism in, in his blood. We like to grab our medical students really young and we try and teach them about the emergency services, how they fit into the greater system of things and, and get to appreciate that care doesn't just start at the front door of the hospital. We integrate the medical, nursing and paramedical science students right from the, the word go. Um, and we share, for example, common lectures and, and practice. And that's very important in trying to get that civility and people actually talking and working together. So in this photograph of graduating people, you have advanced paramedics, um, you have military paramedics, you're having et cetera, et cetera, and medical students. We also have our medical students um, in a community first response scheme, and they share that with the likes of physios and nursing students and whatnot. And they respond to, on a text alert system, so through, through their mobile phone, they respond to um, serious incidents just around campus and in the immediate community. So they provide cardiac first response, just like any other community first response group. <clears throat> and they train twice a month and we give them lectures and we start to kind of develop the team. Um, Dara was very keen and he started competing at Sim Wars. And I know you have a simulation competition later on or a simulation experience later on. And, and this is really important to kind of get that activity and that learning going together. Um, and we had them all the way through in our sim labs at our university. We, we integrate the pre-hospital teams and how they interact. And we do the human factor side of things. We have a prize, the Jim Doran Prize. Obviously, Jim was the, the founder of critical care in 1975. And Dara won that elective prize. And he got to go and train with Sydney Hems, as a, uh, sorry, with London Hems as a medical student. Um, <clears throat> and that helped develop him. And certainly, when he graduated seeing here with his girlfriend, um, he was well on the track already. He already had that seed implanted. So he did his internship with his then fiance and is now you know, well on the pathway and joining us in the junior kind of senior house officer ranks in the emergency department. And we try really hard, we train our registrars every day in these high acuity, low opportunity skills, but we do so in an integrated way with other specialists and we do so um, it, with, with the mindset that they, if they can practice it pre-hospital, they can practice it in hospital. And so we, should, we try to demystify things for them. And like obviously there's a syllabus, and there's a syllabus for pre-hospital emergency care as a subspecialty. Um, and this is managed really by a joint college between the College of Anesthesiologists and the College of Emergency Medicine in the UK. And we try to aim and kind of keep training going on that. But it's these sort of skills that are the most difficult, the rescue skills, the lifelong learning in, in, in how to actually um, conduct pre-hospital care and access patients, that's very, very difficult to teach. 
and we try to get them along with us as early as possible, get them out into the field, get them doing the difficult to access stuff. And certainly the curriculum is very, very little medical in what we need to train them because the medicine is coming because that's what they're learning in emergency departments. They're doing emergency medicine. Um, it's the human factors, the boring stuff, the technical, the operational side of things. And then we get them responding in our, an alternative pathway car, and I'll speak a little bit about the app car a little bit later. And that's where our registrars go out and provide alternative pathways of care around the city. Um, this is a bit of tongue-in-cheek. I gave Dara his bravery award when he did his first pre-hospital thoracotomy supervised alongside with me. Um, and, you know, we started to integrate him more and more into the emergency services, very much in a supervised capacity. Obviously, I took that photograph, but he's providing that care um, over there. And I was very proud of this photograph because this was him when he had come back after doing his first pre-hospital RSI alone. Well, not alone, but with this team and without, you know, direct supervisory support from the senior um, and he's gone on, and this was a picture taken last month now. He is now a fully minted consultant with the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. So we can take these guys through it. It's, we've, we've shown that we have a pathway to do it, but it's still very ad hoc and very difficult. And our biggest struggle is to get the government to actually see that training people in pre-hospital emergency medicine is a thing and is valuable to the system. And once we get that right, once we get the perspectives right, we, we'll start to win a little bit more. But look, it, it's a growing entity. Now, the reason what we have pre-hospital care in Ireland is very, very particular. We are extremely rural. We are extremely isolated in many parts, exactly like yourselves. We don't have the infrastructure in helicopters um, as well grounded that, that you would have necessarily, or the ability to transport people out of rural areas lot to do with our weather, so everything is road-based. Now, um, that's where I live, picture of my son there. Um, that's our level kind of tree hospital, that's our level four, that's where I work. So I commute to work every day for 50 minutes. Um, now, those distances are huge. You're talking 90 kilometers by road just from there to there. Um, it, it, in fact, what happened when, when COVID came along and we had to take patients who were, because there's no ICU facilities here, we had to take patients who were crashing from that level two hospital to the center. You know, we were regularly having to get oxygen delivered to us en route because you simply couldn't carry enough oxygen on, on, on the ambulance to keep up the, the flow rates that were needed for these patients on BiPAP. It was awful. It was simply awful. Um, and like to cover this sort of area, and it's a very, very vast area, this is 2,192 square kilometers, and I'm the only critical care physician for that area. Um, obviously, we have decent wagons, um, so if any of you are petrol heads, um, that's 292 brake horsepower, and it's got full Fox suspension all around. If you don't understand what that means, you're not a petrol head, but I think someone there does. <laughs> so it's a pretty impressive vehicle. Um, and that's the beauty of a charity model, is you, you get what you need to do the job. We're controlled centrally, so the whole of Ireland, except the northern part, is controlled from Tala. So we have one control, and that is extremely important. That's given us our biggest boost so far, is have one single national controller regardless. Not city-wide, not local-wide, not, but one single controller. So when that call comes in, you know, our call takers, there's plenty of them, Somebody can start doing the metronome thing and talking to somebody through hands-only CPR. They'll dispatch two ambulance resources, and then they've got the ability to do this text alert system and dispatch a range of resources. And the reason why we can get a range of resources dispatched is how we govern them, and I'll come into that just now. And we can also obviously dispatch foster ambulances if we need to, but currently our helicopters aren't staffed by physicians. They're, only, they're staffed by advanced paramedics. So it's not bringing anything more than the road ambulance will bring you. What Ireland has in abundance is mehel. And mehel is an old Irish word which really translates to um, neighbors looking after each other. So the farmers would help each other take in the hay because more people would make it faster to cover more ground. And Ireland really does well when you look at Resus Council guidelines. So rural Ireland comes together when, you, when, when someone is sick and injured. So if we look at our bystander CPR rate, our bystander CPR rate is currently at 
That is the highest in Europe. Yours is at 60. Right? We're at 84%. People want to help, and people are prepared to be trained to help. And this is the biggest, you will not, you will, this is unbelievable statistic. 10% of defibrillation attempts happen pre-emergency service arrival. Okay, so, you know, we're doing well. We have 10,000 voluntary community first responders across Ireland. Um, that's huge figures. And, and that's what really keeps people alive. Um, and we obviously support our professional staff through the charity, and we give them, you know, defibrillators, 12 lead ECGs, what they need to do their job when they're at home and off duty. And the reason is this, because if you can only rely on the four ambulances that cover the whole of the 2,165 square kilometer West Cork, you've had it. But we can rely on 20, 30, 40, 50 staff who live in the area, who can come together when the big stuff happens. And when the big stuff happens, that's what you need. You need a community to rally around you and, 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 and get the care right. A true trauma system for Ireland. <laughs> The care of those who were injured was able to begin at the side of the road, and I witnessed that myself last night, rather than having them wait until they came to hospital. And undoubtedly, uh, that saved lives. We moved 11 of the patients to Kerry General Hospital, but we were able to, to fly four additional patients directly from the scene to Cork University Hospital. Um, and from, from a hospital perspective, that's the spread to the world as well. So an integrated trauma system. Now, the joke is, it's not new. You know, this was... Uh, this was 1975, this was the plan that we had. It just never got traction. And we've been talking about it for years and years and years and years, and we still are not there, believe it or not. So the problem that we have in Ireland is most people live rurally. Okay, we do not have people congregating in cities. Most of our population is rural. Okay, and that is very odd in Europe. So our cities, this is actually a density map. Our cities, whilst there are congregations of people, aren't what you expect normally. So inherently, we have to provide care in rural Ireland. And what we've really done is we've just drawn a line across the country and we've said, right, this half go to Cork and that half go to Dublin. And that's quite difficult to do. But we have to provide, as I said, care in the community. And that's where the regulator comes in. So... In many ways, um, our regulation is extremely strong in Ireland. So the regulator, the paramedicine regulator, comes from Department of Health. We are appointed by the minister. So we can do what we need to do to provide pre-hospital care. We do not have to look at a pharmacy regulator to bring a drug product in. We don't have to look at this. We can make the, own, the guidelines. We have the legislation backing up to do that. And what we did very, very early on is no matter what service you work for, you're regulated by the same regulator. So that's really helped. So the basic first aid that the firefighters might have alongside their rescue um, stuff is regulated by us. So their rescue becomes medical rescue. So we're actually able to integrate. We don't have the problems of, oh, the firefighters just do the technical. They're an excellent pair of hands. They can do a lot of the basics right, and they're skilled and trained in it. It goes for private ambulances as well. So no matter what sort of ambulance service you have, you're all under the same standards. It goes for our voluntary sector as well. And we've got a very strong, remember Mehel, we've got a very strong voluntary service in terms of civil defense, Red Cross, Order of Malta, St. John's ambulance services. And even from the basic patient transport to the paramedics and the advanced paramedics, they all work under the same clinical practice guidelines. And that keeps it very strong and very easy and very tight to, to put new things into play, but also to take things away and actually provide evidence-based care quickly. We have obviously a tactical um, component. Um, Ireland is still quite rough and ready, believe it or not. Um, and there is the, the requirement for um, things like tactical uh, TEMS and for uh, likes of our armed guardy. Um, unfortunately, we also live in the same Europe you do, and, and there are bad people out there. But what's very nice is these same police officers are trained in the same structure. So all the reporting, all the paperwork that happens comes back to the same center. And that enables us to 
to really audit it, govern it, and decide what does and what doesn't work. So we're not stuck with legacy problems. Um, it goes the same for our military. And we now do all the NATO training as well for the SOF personnel in, in, a, in our, our hospital and CUH. And these are all medics who go out to various places. And this really helps when you have horrible, horrible disasters. Like Trying for example, to make decisions and make calls that you don't know were right. Looking back at them now, but they were right at the time. You kind of have to look and decide, okay, do I rescue this guy who's drowning currently or he has a life jacket on? Or do I go and do I drag the person who's lifeless in the water, face down, into the boat and try and resuscitate them? So you make split decisions, you do what you can. And so we do that with their normal training. That's how they get themselves going. Now, they dragged out this pregnant woman, both of them drowned. And the next thing they did, because they've reached the end of their protocols, so they're resuscitating, is they have access to telemedicine. So any Irish flag-carrying vessel, doesn't have to be military, has access to telemedical support. All the ambulance service has access to telemedical support. Anybody who is governed by the Pre-Hospital Emergency Council and providing pre-hospital care has access to telemedical support. And that's the service that, that I, I run back, back in Cork. And it's far stronger than if you just provide some local services here and there. Because even an ambulance outside Beaumont Hospital in Dublin with a patient that's going to Beaumont, if they're going to do something, they call us in Cork. All right? So that we can actually keep an eye on things. Um, we've, we've continuously provided the service for about nearly 30 years out of Cork. Um, and it's really, it's, it's, it's in the name, it's, it's, it's support. And we are collegial support there. Our numbers are not small. We're getting a lot of calls every year. Um, and essentially, no matter where that practitioner is, they can call back and chat with a colleague. All right, so we keep the hospital as the hub and keep our colleagues out there able to function and it's really simple, like our, our basic lifeguards on the beach can radio into the um, Coast Guard operator who can patch their call into the professor of emergency medicine who takes the gorilla off their back. And so we see all these calls nationally, we, we record them, we audit them, and then we feed them back through the pre-hospital emergency care council, you know, into the system. It helps when we have our tragedies and when we lost an air crew going out to... Uh, uh, out to sea, it helps that we're able to look at and refine the system after that so that when that happens again, we can change our protocols to enable a far more solid understanding and, and framework of communication. So somebody with severed fingers, for example, used to be an emergency. They used to be plucked out of the sea and taken at all costs to the hospital. And now we go, well, what does a patient need? Well, they need pain relief. Yeah, we can provide that at sea now. They need washed out. Yep, that can probably happen now at sea, and we give them some antibiotics at sea, but they can come in and steam to port. And so we've taken risk through telemedicine and just drastically reduced it by being sensible, by doing just a simple emergency medicine. I did say, look, oh, look our, our, our distances are really, really long, and tomorrow I'm going to be speaking about how we manage, for example, cardiac arrests <laughs> out in the community, where we are using... Um, fully automated CPR to get SATs and blood pressure like that reliably, non-invasively in patients still in arrest. And our ROSC on arrival to hospital rate has climbed since 2019 from 18%, which is the European average, to 47%. That's our ROSC on arrival to hospital rate. Um, so there's a lot of... Um, good research that comes out of having a very integrated system and a well-regulated system. We looked at, for example, research, we look at how we provide analgesia, for example, and traditionally, you know, the paramedics would have had morphine, fentanyl, a bit of entinox and, and whatnot. And we were finding that pain management was still the greatest cause for calls into the telemedicine service. So we thought about changing it. So we, we added a whole bunch of other new pain management strategies out there, um, from methoxyfluorine to... Uh, IV paracetamol to, you know, you name it, ketamine. And then we actually realized that, yeah, fine, we, we improved a lot of things, we made things a lot easier for people, right? But they were still calling us for help with pain. And why? 
How do we manage pain in the emergency department? It's not a drug, is it? It isn't. It's about reducing the fracture, covering the burn, splinting, irrigating. In other words, procedural analgesia and sedation. And so then we change the way that our advanced paramedics sedate. So they do procedural analgesia and sedation really safely with full monitoring as per RCSI guidelines, including entitled CO2, which is carried on every ambulance. All right. And they're able to properly sedate people and manage their pain properly. In other words, reduce that fracture, reduce the medicine. They do the pre-hospital emergency medicine. We've done a lot of research in terms of agitated patient management because agitated patients, oh yeah, let's just give a little bit of a, a, a benzo. No, absolutely not. And we've managed to work out why people are agitated and get good quality evidence from the data that we capture to enable us to provide a much better standard of care. And actually, paradoxically, it's the, emer the pre-hospital emergency medicine research into agitation that has now guided our practice in hospital in how our juniors manage somebody who's agitated. Because we know now the causes are not just some psychiatric. And actually, the causes are probably far more. Um, and above all, I suppose, the one thing that um, we're really proud of is we know that, and this is, this is a very old paper, we know that we can discharge the same number of patients pre-hospital if we put a pre-hospital physician in an alternative pathway car. Um, and our registrar... Uh, our registrars, uh, registrars, who are our junior staff, have a nearly 68% discharge on scene rate. And it's a fantastic team. Um, I'll take this as I literally looked this up last night to see what our registrar did yesterday. And she had three patients over the age of 90, one with DNV, one with end-of-life care, and one with a blocked indwelling catheter. All treated, all safety netted, all appropriately referred on to community teams and not one of those patients over the age of 90 went to an emergency department. Now that is a big win, okay? She then went to an 83-year-old with an explained fall, no head strike, but they were concerned about the knee injury, so was able to divert, not to the emergency department, but to a community clinic which can do an x-ray. Yes, there was an issue. All of that was taken care of, appropriately referred to orthopedics, all right? Never made it into the emergency department, didn't need to, all right? There was the obvious drug overdose, yeah, but we would get them every day. So resuscitated, no problems, and then linked in with inclusion health. So we have a range of services for inclusion health. Oh, and she delivered a baby yesterday. So not a bad shift, I would say, a satisfying shift. Nationally, we've been trying to emulate this, and particularly for the over 75s, and we've put um, chartered physios and um, OTs in with advanced paramedics trying to do the same thing. And they're doing well, but they definitely don't do as well as a fully minted, fully trained emergency physician. Um, and so you cannot do emergency medicine on the cheap. And this definitely isn't emergency medicine on the cheap. Back to tribalism, I mentioned our critical care retrieval services were set up as very much, you know, um, they're very much ICU to ICU transfer services. And over the years, you know, I left them, and over the years they've come back to us. Why? Because anesthetics don't want to work in noisy helicopters. They find it extremely distressing for them, all right? They don't want to sit in a can of farts and, and fly across, you know, from Poland to, to Ireland and, or from wherever, Mali to Ireland, bringing our troops back. They, they just, they're just, it's not in their nature. They're not emergency medicine physicians. And slowly but surely, the critical care retrieval team has actually become very integrated with emergency medicine as opposed to anesthetics. And now, finally, we're starting to get the opportunity to put doctors out into our helicopters and, and, and try and get a critical care service. So in summary, is it worth it? It sounds like an awful lot of boring effort to go and do what we love doing, um, and an awful lot of governance. It definitely is worth it when you can take a young lady and, and ensure that her, her hand is working again. It's definitely worth it when you can take somebody who's profoundly hypothermic, CPR for an hour and 30 minutes. This is fully automated CPR. Those are blood gases of the patient's still in arrest, by the way. Okay, fully automated CPR is a thing. You know, get them to bypass, and they get discharged neurologically intact after three hours in cardiopulmonary arrest. Three hours in arrest, they get discharged three days later. Uh, it's worth it, it's worth it to see, despite all of the issues that I spoke about, <laughs> it's very worth it to see somebody you know, intact after their thoracotomy. Or this chef, 
who has profound brain injury and, and, and ocular injury and, and actually arrested on scene. And he's now back working as a chef. You know, it's great to get those kids home again. It's not all about, you know, seeing your face in the papers or whatever. It's not about that. It's about what it means to mum to get her little boy back from hospital. <laughs> that his heart is beating. That's the best, you know. He's here. <laughs> and he drives me crazy. <laughs> That's the most important <laughs> thing. Like every little boy. Right? Yeah. I love you, baby. Oh. Or the current joke that um, those three babies that I helped deliver are now those three strapping lads, or three of those strapping lads in that. But this to me was my greatest win. This is a good friend of mine, Olivia. She lives local to me. She had a catastrophic traumatic brain injury about six, cycling six years ago. Her ICP was out of control. Um, a few, for about three or four episodes, they, they decided to withdraw on her. And she was sat bolt upright in an attempt to aid venous drainage for six weeks in ICU. Gentle handling, good quality nursing, that's what got her through, good quality rehab. Basically time. It's slow, it's painful. It took years, two years to learn to talk again, and bloody hell, she doesn't shut up now. Um, four years to learn to walk again. And two years after that photograph was taken, we crossed the finish line of the Cork City Marathon together. Don't ever give up. All right. Don't ever give up. We can't save them all, okay? And in the words of John Hines, be kind to each other. Seek out the skeptics. Don't allow wankers to get you down. But above all, make your intentions honorable. And for those who don't know, sadly, John passed away doing what he loved doing. Um, and that was on a motorcycle race. And uh, those members of my team carrying his coffin. That's Irish. Them for you. Thank you. <laughs>